I've written about trailblazing women in the past, mm -hmm. but this time I focused on the collateral damage that for every trailblazing woman or icon, especially in that period, there are people she had to leave behind. Right. Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Melanie Benjamin, and we're going to be talking about her latest novel, California Golden. Now, let's do a little bit of history here. Melanie was one of our first interviews in 2019 when we had our New York office. Remember, she came over and I said, we're doing something different. We're doing these video interviews. And she was fabulous about being one of our first people to sit down and talk to us and say, oh, we're trying this out. This is, I think, going to be fun. I also spoke with her about her last book, The Children's Blizzard, where I froze, like reading the book. I want to put on an extra sweater. I was out there in the on the tundra, I felt like, with those children. So this book, California Golden, is very different. And it takes place on the beach. And it's absolutely the perfect end of summer beach read. But bigger than that, it's a story about a culture. It's a story about a time in history. And it's a story about really women coming of age during this time and what ends up happening with them, along with their absentee mother. Our reviewer, Nora Peel, have this to say about California Golden. I hesitate to label any book a beach read, but how could you call California Golden anything but? This sun-drenched, cautiously optimistic novel simply begs to be read under the summer sun against a backdrop of wave sounds. And I completely agree with her, but I'll tell you, I found so much us that was in this book that was interesting to make it you know, readable to me beyond summer. And with that intro, welcome, Melanie. So good to see you. Oh, Carol, it's always great to see you. And I, I said it before, it never feels like a book launch until I talk to Carol. <laughs> there we go. We're ready to go. We're ready to go. <laughs> so in your author's note, at the end of California Golden, you said that after the children's blizzard, you wanted to write a historical novel set in a world full of sun, not snow. I read that one. I completely understood that sentiment. So tell us how you came to write California Golden. Uh, well, like with Children's Blizzard, um, I kind of gotten away from writing the biographical historical fiction that I think most people associate with me. And for, certainly my first seven books were about real people who lived. Um, but with Children's Blizzard, I, I was starting to feel that that genre was getting awfully crowded and stale for me. I, I just wasn't inspired by real life stories, but still wanted to write historical fiction. So I thought of writing about real event, it, as in Children's Blizzard, and inventing the characters in this, although some of them are loosely inspired by some of the people I encountered in my research. So I wanted to do the same thing with my next book. Um, I also thought a cultural moment could be very interesting too, mm -hmm. instead of one specific day of a historical event, maybe an entire cultural moment. And, um, you know, it took a while to get to this uh, idea. I have a lot of people who weigh in on my uh, what I should do next. I'm very fortunate to have that many people concerned about my career at Random House. And so we went through a lot of different subjects <laughs> before. <laughs> um, and I had had this idea several years ago, actually, um, about something about women in surfing in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking maybe then, maybe more specifically about a particular female surfer. Um, and then I remembered having that idea and I kind of expanded it a bit mm -hmm. to not be so closely, you know, not just one female surfer, but uh, inspired maybe by some real figures, but being more of a, an entire movement. And there is something about the appeal of the sun and the beach and the surf and the beach boys. There, It's a very sunny, kind of innocent kind of era at first, mm -hmm. but then you start to research it a bit. And then you understand the darker themes throughout, uh, underneath all that, the kind of counterculture pulling against the culture. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I thought, I think this could be a really um, an interesting setting for a book that felt a little bit more contemporary mm -hmm. um, for me than some of my previous books. And yet still focusing, I think, on women's stories, women um, who, who are trying to fight, fight the status quo, which many of my books in the past have been about that as well. Yeah, yeah, and, and totally there. And I think it blows me away that the late 50s and the early 60s are historical fiction. Like, do you feel the same way? Because I'm seeing the right, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, That was definitely a big discussion point <laughs> in-house. And also, because we were like, they have to 
come up with cer with certain uh, I don't want to say labels, but tags for their books, even you know, even before they're published. And they were like, "Is this historical fiction?" And because I'm so closely associated with historical fiction, that was one vote in its favor. But they did ultimately. We all kind of decided if it was you know, 60 years ago now, yes. that is historical fiction. But I have seen some reader reviews that a little unhappy that events they remember are yeah. now considered historical fiction. But to me, it's like, you know, when your favorite song suddenly is on the oldies radio station <laughs> or oldies Pandora station, that's kind of where we are. So yeah, it is historical fiction. It, it's me listening to Sirius X on the 70s, 80s and 90s, because anything else I'm really not going to know and sing along <laughs> with. And I, I was like marvel at these kids, like there were concerts singing. I'm like, where did you hear that song? Like I've never heard it. It's very funny. We're I'm, listening to stations we are not listening weird. to. <laughs> we're listening to the oldie stations now. It's just really funny. So the Donnelly family was actually the Donnelly. OK, there are three characters in the book, the mother and the two daughters. Just, so you know, we're talking about the Donnelly's was inspired by actual historical figures. So can you tell us about them? Because there's there is a uh, history of women in surfing. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, I was looking in, into the stories of some of those early female surfers. Um, there were many names that caught my eye. Margo Oberg, Linda Benson, um, Joyce Hoffman, women who really um, broke some barriers and, and hung out with the boys, even though they weren't really entirely welcome. But I did come across a picture of a, 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 three beautiful blonde goddesses, basically. And um, this was Marge Calhoun and her two daughters. And I actually can't remember her daughter's names now. Um, Cindy and something. I don't remember her. Candy? I don't remember her daughter's names. Anyway, there was something about that idea of the mother and the two daughters, teenage daughters together in this era of like their 60s, early, early 60s, competing together. That was really intriguing to me. One, I mean, they certainly look like your every version of a California girl you ever thought. But then I started, I, being me, a novelist, I started wondering about the family dynamics they're in. And while I'll, this book is not their stories, because I truly don't know what their fi family dynamics were, and they had different lives. But the fact is, Marge Calhoun is now considered one of the first, the first female world champion surfer mm -hmm. um, in 1950. Eight, maybe it was, or 55, I can't remember. She won the Makaha International Surfing Tournament in Hawaii. And she was considered the first woman to go on a surfing safari, which in those days in the 50s, not a lot of people did. If they did, they were men. And it mainly, you know, you left the mainland, you went to Hawaii during the best surfing months, and you basically lived on the beach and surfed. And that's all you did. And it was very rare for a woman to do this. And when I read about the fact that she had done so, and she had left her two daughters behind. Mm. That's, that's, that's the, and that's the end of any similarities between the people in my book and the real Marge Calhoun and her daughters. But it just, I thought, well, that's an interesting thing to start to build a story about mothers and daughters and sisters. Um, I've written about trailblazing women in the past, mm -hmm. but this time I focused on the collateral damage that for every trailblazing woman, or icon, especially in that period, there are people she had to leave behind right. in order to do it. And that's the daughters in this story. And I, this is their story. This is, you know, did they want to compete to be with their mother? Were they forced into it? Were they any good? Did somebody resent something? I mean, it's the whole thing mm -hmm. that I wanted to explore. And it was just that one photo that really that's triggered that. Yeah, but these three people on the beach, let's just sit there and think about this. Yeah. Like, to be really enamored with watching shows about surfing. I really am. I've actually watched Mavericks. I watch it like on, you just watch this big surf competition, which is in Northern California. I recently watched both seasons of the hundred foot wave on HBO max, which is oh, wow. phenomenal. If you haven't watched it, I like highly recommend it. These what? people travel to these, like these really remote areas. And then how many people show up? I and mean, they canceled it in 2020, just because so many people were standing up on the hill watching. And it was COVID. And they were so worried that they shut surfing down that year. And right. it was in someplace off the coast of Portugal or, or by Portugal where they were. And oh, wow. it's terrific. And but when you're watching this, you still are seeing how few uh, females. And I think that there's and one or two that are portrayed. And that's it. Everybody else yeah. is men. I actually just read an article about the female, uh, the women in the in the whatever the surf. 
surfing organization, the International Surfing Organization now, complaining about the very things I talk about in my book. Because in you know in that era, when if women wanted to compete, there the women always got the worst day of waves, mm-hmm. right? That if there were the competition was scheduled for two days, if there was only going to be one good day of waves, that was reserved for the men, not the women. That still happens today. Wow. Um, also, certainly prize money was much less for women. In this article, that still happens today. Um, it, it's uh, it's incredible how uh, sexist and racist this sport truly yes. is, yes. Uh, especially when you consider that it, it originated from Polynesia and Hawaii, where men, women, all children, everybody served. There was none of that to it. But I think um, when it became first kind of like uh, the image was the white male surfer, California surfer guy in the 1950s and 60s, when attitudes towards women and limitations uh, that women had to come up against were much stronger and much more strict, that that, you know, like any female in a sport trying to compete against the men, they weren't exactly welcome. But unfortunately, in this sport, it remains today. But it's probably like that in every sport, too. But, you know, women's soccer complains, everybody complains about like, you know, are we on the same playing field? Are we on the same whatever? It's 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 pretty much um, indigenous to women's sports at this time, yeah. including like the basketball um, finals last year. I remember they didn't have a training room and the men yeah. had like in these large facilities and things like that. And what I found that was really interesting though, too, is because we're talking about a time, like there's a, it's, a, it's like a counterculture, but it was the, the, the better counterculture because it wasn't, it was thought of as Gidget goes to the beach. But when you're reading this, you're realizing that the Gidgets were not the only people on the beach. And it was very right. different culture going on there. There were uh, the people that Gidget discovered. And we can talk about Gidget all day long about how surfing prior to Gidget wasn't very po- wasn't popular in the United States. There, there were men and some women surfing, but they were truly outlaws of society, right? Not respectable people. And then... This 1957, this teenage girl spends a, a summer at the beach and gets adopted by these male surfers at Malibu, who nickname her Gidget. Her, her screenwriter father hears her talking to her friends about it. He writes a book called Gidget, the little girl with big ideas. And all of a sudden, whammo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, it, it, it spawned this entire cultural movement of Gidget, the book, the movies, the beach party movies, the Beach Boys, Jan and Dean, the whole musical thing that came out of it. It was huge. Um, but prior to Gidget, it really was just, it was not respectable. You know, you wouldn't boast about, you know, spending the summer surfing and doing nothing else. And the And the men who were drawn to it, we're not always the nicest people, you know, <laughs> there was, they, they, they were misogynists for sure. There were a lot of, you know, the racists, there were, uh, they surfed with Nazi helmets on because they kind of like idealized that as a symbol of something. I don't know. I mean, it, they were a bunch of scruffy, not so nice dudes. That's for sure. But then, but then some, you know, Hollywood kind of packaged it all up and sold it to the world. And all of a sudden it was something every teenage kid in America wanted to do. Exactly. Everybody wanted to surf and long boards and all this kind of stuff. Did you watch surf footage as you were researching for like, you know, what to do? <laughs> I did not surf myself. I mean, um, I mean, I was researching this. I was like, I, I was a 58 year old woman with a half of an ACL on one leg. There was no way I was going to get on a surfboard. <laughs> Uh, but we actually, my husband and I vacation in Newport Beach every year. We have a timeshare through Marriott and we go there every year for like a couple of weeks. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of time watching surfers there, drove up to Malibu, went down to Laguna Beach. Um, but there's a, a thing on Amazon Prime called the Surfing Network. Oh, I have to find this. <laughs> I was I was going to tell you, you need to find this. <laughs> just full of documentaries about surfing endless summer of course being on there i think there was one about mavericks that i watched and um old footage of old competitions and it's just yeah there's a lot of footage out there there's also a thing called the encyclopedia of surfing that i subscribed to which had newspaper accounts of like almost every surfing competition from like 1955 up to today Wow. So if there was any publicity about it, any press at all, any photos or any videos, and sometimes they were just homemade, you know, movie camera footage, they have that there. So mm-hmm. I got to see what those beaches looked like in the 50s 
Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, compared to what they are now, because, you know, I could go to Malibu today, but it doesn't look like it did in 1955. Ah. No, yeah. no, no. Just before we started talking, I told you about my friend whose parents <laughs> bought the house in 1950s. Yeah. And but she says it's everyone's doing yoga on the beach. That's what she calls it, yoga on the water. And people just yeah. sit out there for hours waiting for a wave. And you know, I feel like it's instead of going to yoga class, people just say, oh, we'll go get our boards after we drop our kids off at school and go do this. It's very <laughs> funny. It's very funny. So did you were you able to get to Hawaii for any of your research? I know this was COVID days. No, it was during, it was COVID days. I really wanted to go, but it was COVID days. And, you know, you'd have to be quarantined for two weeks, mm, you know, right. and, and nobody really wanted to travel out. I mean, far during those days in case you got COVID and you couldn't get back in or you would have to quarantine. So no, I, I, I have never been to Hawaii. I would love to go to Hawaii. But as much as this book is about surfing, you know, at its heart, it is uh, this tangled relationship between mothers and, and, and daughters. Yes, and yes. Feelings yes. of abandonment and trying to catch up and and then being sucked in very different way, directions in the 1960s, which was so turbulent. Yeah. And, you know, it's, 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 you're just getting to a couple of places here, gives you an idea of what it was like, you know, just surfing is like. But I really enjoyed the, the relationships between the mothers and the daughters and what ended up happening, the rifts and everything that happened. And the first yeah. part of the book is the longest, which is about the two daughters. And I have mm-hmm. to admit, I thought it was going to start with the mom. I thought it was going to go like when I picked up the book, I'm like, oh, this is going to be linear. We're going to hear about Carol, the mom surfer. And then we'll hear about her having these two girls. And then we'll hear about how they all go together. Like they surf together. And it was flipped when I opened it because it's the longest. It's about Mindy and her younger sister, Ginger, who grew up in Southern California in the fifties. Then the second part about their mom, Carol, and we get to understand her, but it's not that big a part, but we already know so much about her. And then the third part is about all three of the Donnelly women. So what made you choose to divide the story up in this way? Because to me, it worked so much being able to get to know them first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, A couple of things I did originally. So I always knew how the book was going to begin with that scene on the the beach with Mindy and Ginger and their doll, you know, dancing to Dick Dale and doll tons. And it's just this perfect California day. And then you realize it's a movie set. Like, you know, that they're, they're, they're not really playing instruments and everything. The sand was trucked in and then they're, they're extras in a movie, one of the beach party movies. Um, so I always wanted to start it there because I thought that was a great way to start the book in. And at the end of that chapter, when there's this moment where the older sister, for the first time in her life, thinks only of herself and leaves her younger sister to fend for herself, kind of breaking up this 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 plan that they had had since they were children. And then I was going to start the next chapter with Carol's point of view, mm-hmm. just like you would expect, exa- and then alternate the three. But you know, uh, every time I went back to Carol's point of view then, because it had to start back in the 40s when she became a, a mother, um, I always felt it dragged down. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to go back to Mindy and Ginger. I always wanted to know what's going on with Mindy and Ginger. So I took out all the Carol chapters, and I wasn't entirely sure I was ever going to put them back in. But then we reached a point in the book where there's a big, huge, like, oh, my God, thing that happens. And by then, we have seen Carol only through the eyes of her daughters. Mm -hmm. And we know she's a pretty terrible mother Mm -hmm. and was a horrible wife. Mm -hmm. And something's happened to cause a rift in this family that was never, you know, a functional family to begin with. Right. And. I like the idea of getting to thinking we know her, thinking we know all about her and how horrible she is. And then you go back and you see this woman who was a girl once, a teenager with dreams of of being, you know, athletic stardom. And in, but during World War II and what happens when no spoilers, she gets pregnant and how she she's supposed to conform to be Donna Reed, right? That's yes. what you expect, yes. but how, that's not her. And, and and how damaging that is, you know, to, and she rebels against it in one way you want to go, yay, because she finally finds her passion and pursues it, but it is at the expense of her daughters. Mm-hmm. But I wanted us to then understand and may, maybe not forgive Carol for what she's done, uh, but at least understand, have some sympathy for women in that era who um, had dreams outside of the kitchen, Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And we don't always talk about female athletes. You know, if we talk about people breaking the mold in the 50s and 60s, it tends to be scientists or, or you know, Margaret Sanger or or writers or whatever. But I was fascinated by the athletic thing, you mm-hmm. know, that how the 
so few avenues for athletic people whose women whose per, you know, passion was athleticism outside of say figure skating or tennis or golf I mean exactly. what you weren't supposed to be an athlete mm -hmm. and female athletes were suspicious were they feminine enough the stuff that they had to go through to prove their femininity um and what happens when you don't get to pursue that anymore the thing you were Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that gave you purpose that your body, you knew your body was for. And then all of a sudden it's told to do other things, mm -hmm. you know. So that's why I did it that way. Yeah. Um, and I also felt like as children, when we're young, we don't know who our parents are. Mm -hmm. Right. We, yeah. don't know, we don't know who they were when they were young and hopeful and had dreams. We only know, rightly so. Are they taking care of us? Do they love us? That's what we need from them. And And her daughters don't get any of that. But as children, you know, they couldn't have they they wouldn't have appreciated knowing who their mother was. But by the time in the book, when they find out and we find out, they are old enough. They've been through enough on their own. Yeah. You know. Let's see what yeah. happens and see what she, what she said. There's this moment where she makes a call and she hangs up the phone and she realizes she's trapped. And she realizes there's this moment that she will have to go home. Her husband's left. She's got to go home. She's got to go home. But she realizes that for having the freedom of having gone to Hawaii at this moment, she's now going to be able to think for the rest of her life, I could have had that. And she's going to have to go back to her other life. And I just thought that those sections were so poignant about what she was doing, including that at one point she's making a phone call home and they say, you have children? Like the yeah. people did not they didn't know fascinated me but she yeah. was 29 it's not like she was 43 or 40 know, but, but 29 20, in 1955 old. that was old or 58 whenever it was that is matronly right right you know she talks about the clothes that she's supposed to wear that she you know she she wants to wear swimming suits all day she doesn't want to wear the cinch waist and this fluffy skirt and the high heels and and i think in from what I could read in the early surfing community that we're talking about, which included people like Buzzy Trent, who became one of the first big wave surfers, um, what who they were when they weren't on the beach, nobody wanted to know. Right. I mean, that's what surfing was. It's only about the waves. And so for her to fit into this community, which she very much wants to, because it is her tribe, she recognizes them. Um, she has to not talk about Mm -hmm. The fact that she has left a daughter, two daughters and a husband back home mm -hmm. because one, she's very aware on one level that's going to change the way they look at her. Right. Suddenly she's going to be somebody's mother and that's going to affect the way they treat her, which she's earned their respect and admiration through her skill on the water. But the minute she says, I have two children that she knows that's gone, right. they're only going to see her as a mother. And that's Carol's dilemma mm -hmm. because in that time period, that's the only way women were identified. I mean, you were Mrs. Sobo and so, right? You, you know, and she's found a way back to her truest self. And, but in order to have that, she has to deny her children. Mm -hmm. And when it all comes out and it all blows up, yeah, she, she's, uh, she realizes she is forever trapped. Right. And if you remember Donna Reed and Ozzy and Harriet, that's the timing that she's at. And those women who got dressed in their finest all day to vacuum. <laughs> It's like really it wasn't really true. I don't think housewives <laughs> in the fifties truly put on high heels to to vacuum, but but yet there was certainly a lot of that. There was a ring of truth to it. <laughs> and I did like when she went out to dinner, she would never wear stockings because it was just too, far too inhibiting because it wasn't pantyhose. It was like putting on the girdle and all this stuff. And, and she used to wear that when she went out. And then also her, her daughters notice it's like mom's allergic to sleeves. She never wears, she, she lives in California, so it's okay. Always sleeveless. Yes. Blouses and dresses and all that. And, and um, just little things that I think Carol would have done right. um, to, to do in her own little way to rebel and also and to celebrate her athleticism, mm -hmm. you know, because women had to hide that. You know, they had they and into you know, the party in the book where when she's competing in school in high school on her swim team and the softball team and they had to do beauty pageants afterwards. That's true. Wow, That is true. There was some, you know, they, it was like women could compete. But then then oftentimes there would be some kind of weird little beauty pageant at the end where they were judged only on their beauty and kind of had to hide the athleticism part, the strength 
part and appear soft and feminine. And what a mess that it time was. was. Just, it, and, you know, we, we look back at it and people go, oh, those were so the days. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. A woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So the two well, sisters. Please, go do anything. Yeah. The sisters are really on their own. Mindy's the better surfer. Ginger's clearly part of the crowd, more into the social scene than Mindy is. Was one sister easier to write than the other? Was I identified it more with Mindy for sure. Right. Right. Um, her ambition, right. her uh, you know, the 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 being, you know, I yeah, I I think I Mindy was closer to me. So in one way she was easy to write, and Ginger was like completely opposite of anything I've ever ever experienced or would ever experience. Mm-hmm. Yet in some ways her sections came to me easier. Because they were more fully imaginative. Yes. Like I have never tripped. I have never taken acid. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so that the section where she's tripping on the beach, you know, that's that's where I get my weird imagination to just take me places it's never done before. And pretty much all of Ginger, Ginger's more, um, Mindy's more cerebral, even though she's more athletic. Ginger's pure instinct and emotion and animalism. I mean, her. The physicality of Ginger's sections, because at, at a certain point she's reduced to just, you know, worrying about bodily functions even, yes. you know, and, and not not having shampoo and not being able to. Be, I mean, there's such a primitive kind of thing that she is sucked into in some ways, reduced to yeah. that. I don't know. That was kind of more fun to write. Yeah. Then, and like how they're going to steal and how they're going to go do this and how they're going to survive by going to steal food to eat because they yeah, did. And, and running drugs over the border from Mexico. I mean, these are not things I've ever done, yeah. <laughs> I have to say for the record. Yeah. But I also, I mean, I did like Mindy's sections too because of her obsession with celebrity and her taste however minor of a minor kind of celebrity and fame in California um, was, that was fun too. The whole whiskey, a go-go part of her and the USO tour actually was that was quite I you know I think Carol was probably the least easy for me to write yeah yeah but you know it was interesting because Whiskey A Go Go I remember when I worked at Mademoiselle Magazine years ago that was still the place to go that was a place it's that we always no, and, yeah, it's, it's still and that's very... still the place to go so it's really yeah. funny that you have some things that are cultural icons you think of the time but they're still surviving all these decades later you know as this yeah this, yeah this I mean long. And also as the girls journeys progress through the entire decade, which I originally thought I was going to only stay in the early sixties era, but then I thought, let's, you know, they, they're, they're growing up They're they're experiencing life and they're doing it in the 1960s. So we're, you know, let's talk about what was going on in the 1960s. And there's an awful lot I left out of the book, Mm -hmm. but yet it astonished me how much California was kind of the epicenter of so much of what we think of as, you know, the turbulent era of the 60s with the the cults, mm-hmm. um, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, which is a big part of my book, which is true, which truly was a cult, mm-hmm. drug running cult that manufactured um, LSD up in Laguna Beach. Um, and then against the whole, you know, the Whiskey Go Go kind of thing. And then the music scene changing. And there's a little bit about that coming in, how Northern California kind of became, you know, the epicenter of music then uh, versus Southern California. And then of course, then we got to Vietnam and Mm -hmm. I definitely had to uh, incorporate Vietnam Mm -hmm. into somebody's story because yeah. And it was like, you know, as the time moves on, you've got to be moving chronologically with what's happening in the world as well. You know, and Carol's life is almost moving nomadically. She seems to care about the ocean more than anything else. And this is in contrast to her later years where she could just bear witness. We won't talk, I won't give away what's going on, but those moments where you talk about her sitting with her binoculars, always being able to watch the ocean and looking for the next great swell was so moving because you realize that this woman was sort of trapped in the ocean as I sat there, like looking at this and she was like completely there. And it's surfing this kind of sport where um, older folks are either deified or forgotten. In a hundred um, foot wave, there's a man that's much older. He's got three children. One of the children is born right practically on screen, the third one. And you're, but you're sitting there and you're watching and he's older, but he's the trustworthy person about what happens. And he's making sure the people, remember during these days, they were not going out on jet skis to go out and get the great wave. Oh, you no, no. To go get the wave. You were, it's not where the, it's not where surfing has gone to today. No, today so, it's all about big wave surfing, all of it. And it wasn't then. Mm-mm. Yeah, 
no, there was just, it was more about form and it was about, you know, all these other kinds of things going through. And is it the surfing the sport where the older people are deified or forgotten? Like, what do you, when you were reading, did they reach a certain age that you just didn't hear about the people anymore, especially well, the women? So many of them, I mean, you know, very few of them surfed later in life. I mean, um, so there are some icons of that era. Mickey Dora, for sure, who is a character in my book is very loosely based on Mickey Dora. But you ask anyone in surfing now, they're like, he was the coolest dude ever. I spoke of Buzzy Trent. He's, you know, still well up there. There's uh, Greg. Uh, oh, can't remember his name. Anyway, so I, I mean, I think today people look back at those early surfers and, and they are gods. Even Carol, you know, March Calhoun, they're gods and goddesses. They raise them up. But when you look at how long they actually surfed, um, it's then it was very youthful, obviously, because everybody, you know, were, there weren't anyone old enough to have really been surfing back in the day and stay up. But it's also interesting as drugs became a bigger part of this surfing mm -hmm. world, how many of those really cool early surfers had tragic early deaths? either um ODing or surfing while hot you know while impaired and having terrible accidents um uh, surfers didn't I mean some of those early surfers just didn't live very long let's mm -hmm. I mean I mean no there's their skin cancer obviously was a big part a, a, a thing that they all had to deal with later in life I mean because they were out on those waves not wearing wetsuits back then right. and spending all day in the water and probably you know nobody knew about sunscreen <laughs> Right. <laughs> so skin cancer was a big thing. So, I mean, the era that I'm talking about, there were just no older spokes for people. There were. And then, again, I think surfers today look back on these women and men fondly, but there are very few of them around. Right. Just have done that. Occupational hazard, I guess, of the job. It was I mean, like even Gidget. She only surfed one summer. It was when she was 16 and or 15 or 16 and she was bored. It was high school. And the next year she went off to college and then she eventually married and she had children. And, you know, she's still alive. The real Kathy Conner is still alive, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, not part of the surfing community. And that's the other thing. The people who just stayed in the surfing community tended to be those who, who weren't really going to live long anyway, right. you know. You know, most people grew up and out of it at some point and realized a job would be nice. <laughs> not stealing nice food to, would be good. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice to to not have to live in a shack on the beach anymore. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> no, I guess it's going to do. Did you know the entire story fleshed out before you started writing? Like, I know you said that you didn't want to do the Carol chapter like right there, but did you know where the arc was going to kind of go? For the most part. Um, like I said, I originally hadn't thought it was going to take me through the whole decade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hadn't originally planned on the, the USO tour that Mindy goes on to Vietnam. Um, I did know that I did want to include like the, the cult part. My agent said to me once, she always finds books really, she really enjoys books where there's a lot of tension between culture and counterculture. Mm -hmm. And when she said that, that really helped me crystallize the story of the two sisters, which directions they'd go. One would go totally culture pop culture at a cost and the other one would be sucked down into mm -hmm. that the cultish under you know counterculture at a cost so yeah I, I had it pretty much in mind and even including the ending I knew I wanted to end it that way it huh. was more of a structural thing that that I had to switch around yeah, yeah, move on and back and forth. You listen to a number of books and articles about this period of history and the growth of surfing. Is there was there an, any aha moment in your research? Was there this moment where you sat there and went, "Whoa, didn't see that," or, "Boy, I'm really well." Learning about the well, okay. I mean, here's a they burn so Gidget. You know, it's Gidget, Gidget, Gidget. She's beloved. Everybody loves Gidget. All those guys love Gidget, except some of those guys that that she palled around with that summer when they discovered she was Jewish, they spray painted a cross on her driveway. Wow. Oh. And she didn't talk about that in her book. Right. Right. But so I was like, I couldn't believe that. And that, that led me into learning a little bit more about the racism in um, surfing the localism, the, um, the Nazi kind of worship that there, you know, that Mickey Dora, you know, again, wore this, he wore a, a Nazi helmet that his dad had brought back from the war surfing. And they thought that was the cruelest thing ever. And swastikas, some of them would paint swastikas on the board and they looked at it as this cool outlaw thing kind of, 
this, but there's a lot of white supremacy right. inherent yeah. Yeah. in I mean, that. Yeah, uh, yeah it, partic- it still today, but in that era in particular. And um, just, I also wanted to at least talk about some of the cultural appropriation mm-hmm. uh, that that is at the heart of surfing, stealing it from the Hawaiian culture, where it was truly a mystical experience i mean it was fun but it was also like a way for them to you know be one with nature and the sun and the sea and 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 it all and then how we appropriated it to be something different and and also excluded you know hawaiians for such a long time unfortunately and um that was surprising to me right to learn that part of it yeah. yeah, that was what was going on. Did the writing of this book come any more easily than any of the others you've written? Or <laughs> so you just <laughs> <laughs> they are all so different, right? You know, every book writes itself differently. Um, I, I wrote this book during the hardest year of my life. Um, mm-hmm. my husband and I had stupidly decided, decided to relocate from our beloved Chicago to Virginia during the pandemic, and it was a big, big mistake. And my father that was dying that year that mm-hmm. I was writing this mm-hmm. and I was managing his care long distance and making many, many very difficult trips back and forth from Virginia to Indiana, you know, when flying was just a freak, you know, a freak show. And then my husband and I both experienced some emotional challenges in the aftermath of that and being so isolated and ultimately just ended up moving back home to Chicago. And this is the year that I wrote this book. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I don't know how I did it. I honestly don't know how I did it, except that I suppose it became um, my escape. I was going to say, from, escape. yeah, yeah, from these traumas that we, we were going through. So in that one way, it truly was the hardest book I've ever written, just mm-hmm. because I didn't have the luxury that I know normally have of only concentrating on the book. Mm-hmm. Right. Of having everything else around me be nice and stable and familiar and stress free. And all I have to worry about is the book, which I've been fortunate to be able to do for all my books until this one. So in that way, it was the hardest. But I think the writing of it was um, it, it flowed very easily. I didn't struggle mm-hmm. with it. I knew the story. I knew the arcs. I knew the characters. I knew what I wanted the themes to be. Um, so when I did write um, it, it, I was able to write very prolifically. Yeah. I remember when you moved there and there, there was a little shack in the back that you were going to make into your house. You're going to make, you're, yeah. you're gonna, as soon as I didn't see that finished, I was like, Hmm, I'm just wondering if they're going to it was not. It was a, a beautiful area. It was warmer. That's yeah. nice from Chicago, I suppose. Um, but it was an area where there were a lot of retirees that we weren't really quite aware of. Mm. And my husband and I, maybe even if we are the same age of many of them, we are just not that kind of person. You know, yeah. I, I couldn't play pickleball and go bird watching all day long. <laughs> it's just what my neighbors did. Yeah, you can really say that because we were with some people the other night and they were like, oh, you know, we'd like to downsize our house. We'd like to do this, that, and the other. And my husband and I are kind of like looking at, like, like I'm kind of shocked. And so we went out to dinner and I said to him, so what do you think about retiring? And he's like, what would we do all day long? And I was just there. I said, well, you play golf. I mean, you could probably go do that every day. I could sit but by not every day. Every, but, and he said, I don't think I could play every day. He goes, no, I don't think no. I could do every day. So we started having these whole, like he plays very early in the morning, plays like seven o'clock and he's still home by like, you know, 10, 30, 11. But I'm laughing because I said, I just don't know what I would do all day long. I said, so yeah. let's see, I'd read books. I'd probably write about them. I'm like, isn't that what I'm doing That's now? What you do. <laughs> I have a good garden, <laughs> but I even couldn't do that all day long. Like I, I well, can first that period of time and then that's like it. I can't do it anymore. You know, we moved from a, a townhouse in Chicago to um, a beautiful ranch home in Virginia with a big lo- yard and a big garden. I like to garden. So I was like, oh, I'll be garden. I, the garden took us over. Oh, work. Like so the much amount work. of time to, I mean, it was like the jungle encroaching on our house every day, the way things grow down there. And it, so much time that we had no time for anything else. <laughs> like, like a weed, not... like a weed. You know, I know. Yeah, it was. It was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it. So then we, we, and also we were too far away from everyone we knew and loved, and had a weird expectation that they'd visit us. Uh-huh. And you know what? People don't do that. <laughs> and even no. our kids never came to see us. So we, we, uh, 
we fled back to Chicago, which for all its flaws, it's still our home. It's who the we home. are. And back with our the our peeps, our tribe, our theater, our messy, messy city. Love it, love it, love it. Downsize. Yeah. We did downsize this time, but um if we, my, my husband keeps going, if we had a downsize, we need three years. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's totally true. Because it, well, the, first of all, the number of books, the books are in every room. I mean, we well, gave a house yeah. in New York, like the 2000 square foot office moved home. So just picture oh, right. everything coming to the house. You know, yeah. It's been great. We, uh, one of our requirements when we moved back, um, because we knew we wanted to live uh, near the lake this time, because we, so we have a view of the lake and we're in a, a high rise building, but um, we couldn't look at any of the brand new, newer ones because they're all glass, right? Glass walls, glass windows. So you can see the view. We need walls because of all the bookshelves. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we were specifically looking for an older uh, vintage and, and we got that because mm. of the wall space so right. that we could have our bookshelves everywhere. So you don't see it right now. Cause I'm in this little nook that it, but I'm facing all bookshelves. bookshelves in front of me and then there's just walls and walls of them and the rest of them. <laughs> yeah it, it's really it's interesting when I was in Chicago years ago I was staying like right by the water and we'd go down and everybody be playing volleyball right after work and everybody be going in you know in the water and I was like this could be a great life because you could be at work and then two minutes later be on the beach sitting yeah. there playing volleyball or I just don't think that they don't, they don't realize that the, the lake is, I mean, the beach is literally in the city. Um, mm -hmm. We live north of that. Um, we're on the har between two harbors. So it's actually, it's like walking in a little New England fishing village where we are. You know, there's mm -hmm. a golf course. You talk about a golf course, there's a golf course and two harbors. The beach part's a little further south, but it, we're still right on the water. And it's, you know, lovely to be able to walk out my street and go under Lakeshore Drive and then I'm on the beach. And right. I love to, I love it in the winter too. I love the lake in the winter. It's, yeah. Yeah. Water, water yeah it's, it's a, we're very lucky and people don't always understand that part of how much of Chicago is truly, um, it's, it's water. <laughs> you're not surfing, but you're on the water. You're not surfing. Yeah, although I, I hear some people do surf on Lake Michigan. I don't, I don't, I mean, I suppose maybe in the fall when the storms are well, out. And bigger waves. waves. Yeah. Whenever I was there. Yeah, was we, don't really, <laughs> we don't have a surf to speak of here. Like you have on an ocean we don't have that kind of thing, but mm, I guess some people do. Slides. Quite the same yeah. way. So how do you work with your editor? Do you, okay. You say this idea up front. This is what I want to do. And then you just go write or do a couple of chapters. How do you do this? Well, um, I run it by my agent first. And if she, and she's, I love her. I mean, she, Alexandra Machinas for CAA. I mean, she will tell me, well, that's crap. No one's going to want to read that. <laughs> <laughs> and I like really, I appreciate it. I love it. This is exactly what I need for someone. So once she and I, I think, once I get her attention with an idea, then I will go usually write a, a synopsis and some, a few pages, you mm -hmm. know, which, and then um, she'll look at it, make a suggestion or two, or maybe not. And then we submit it to my editor um, who then takes it to many other people in Random House. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of editorial people who kind of weigh in mm -hmm. um, um, and they'll say no. And, and, and it, you know, it, it's painful sometimes when I really like, love an idea that I really, really want to do and to be told, uh, we don't see this for you. No, no. I mean, I could always say, well, I'm going to write it anyway, but that would not be in my best interest because you really, really want everybody there to be behind your book. So mm -hmm. um, then I go back and repeat the process. And, you know, sometimes depending on what's going on, there might be a push to maybe switch genre a bit because mm -hmm. maybe what you know they see trends certain trends or uh, thinking for me what might be next there were that there was a bit of that discussion this time mm -hmm. but I kind of wanted to stay with historical fiction very strongly as did my um, agent so then it was just a matter of finding that sweet spot you mm -hmm. know that that one subject everybody could really get behind mm -hmm. um, and that whole process now can can sometimes take months Wow. Uh, it really did with with California Golden, um, just because it was a new contract. And it was just, a, you know, we all felt after six historicals. Seven historicals. Yeah, seven this oh. is eight. <laughs> seven. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you're always trying to reach a wider audience. Right. right. You, you got to grow your audience. And, and so there was a definite um, pressure to, to consider that. Um, 
so yeah so uh but I, I i keep i find ideas all the time and i keep a word document full of them right so uh i have never run out of ideas i never I have the, the more contemporary time of history i think is going to be having a moment i really do think i think it is definitely. already having a moment having a moment With lessons in chemistry yes um you know this there's uh we were talking about Kristen hannah's book coming out also yes. set in the same time period uh i think i read the new um uh, Anne McDermott's new book is also set in uh, coming out this fall, I believe, or early winter, which I love her. I love her books. It's also a Vietnam kind of background of a book as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think you're right. Um, I've written in many different eras in all yeah. my books. But I, I could tell you right now, no one would be really excited about me going back to the 1800s. Like I wrote two books, you know, set in that time period. It, that's not real popular right now and historical. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes World War II has been a little bit worn out and there are different yeah. different times. I mean, I think that now we're looking at what are the ramifications after the war and then there became another war. And I think that we forget that there was like, it was World War II, Korea, Vietnam. Yeah. We went boom, boom, right. boom like this. We forget this. Korea all the time. Nobody talks forget about it. Korea. Forget yeah. it. Forget it. And a lot of times people didn't actually go to Korea. The number of people who went to Korea was not as big as the number of people that I feel, and I could be wrong, and somebody's going to write me on this, that went to <laughs> Vietnam. And for the long period of time, the people of Vietnam, and I feel like I might be wrong, but I feel like when we were wa- like hearing about it, I just didn't feel like we've heard about it the same way. And maybe it's something that needs to be mined more. Maybe I am completely wrong and I forgot history, you know? Well, I agree it was a much shorter conflict. And we, you know, we were technically in Vietnam long before anyone knew that Mm -hmm. there was anything going on in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then I think also there was just something about that with the draft in 68 um, truly happening um, in a way. I mean, the Viet, the draft for Korea was still in effect from the World War II draft. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like a new thing. But then all of a sudden Vietnam and it's a different time. You know, and then the world's on fire anyway, and everybody's rebelling, and and so I think it just looms in our cultural. It was I also think Vietnam. I think Korea being too so close to World War Two also mm-hmm. doesn't help. You know, us remember that very well. well it's also when people when World War Two was over, it was the creation of the suburb. It was the creation of, and it it, it moved people out of the city. It moved people to different places after the war. And now all of a sudden that was during the Korean time as well. It's not like something, I mean, I found that I learned something really interesting yeah. that like in the sixties was when it became a two car family. It became two car family uh-huh. for the first time uh-huh. was in the sixties. Cause before that you only had one car and cause the, the wife wasn't leaving except to go to the food store, but it was. And then the groceries were delivered anyway, you know, it so. was just a very, very different time. So it was the title always California Golden. No, um, we struggled a bit with that. I, I mean, obviously, my first idea of a title was California Girls. Duh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there is actually a couple books with that title. Really. Yeah. Not not big books, but, but books out there. So that was scratched. Then I started going through Beach Boys lyrics. And I thought uh, my next idea was God Only Knows. Because, mm-hmm. you know, that what beautiful Beach Boys song. Uh, but then my editor... <laughs> wisely pointed out most people would think this is a religious book that's exactly <laughs> i'll go with her go. thank you alexandra <laughs> so then i just i don't know why i came up with california golden um it is the golden state and to me california golden came to rep that those words came to represent i think more mindy it was like this is mindy that that kind of the that california golden stardust fame thing mm-hmm. but then but the irony of 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 uh the the toll that that takes mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. sacrifices and and that is not all golden mm-hmm. as we tend to think it is so I like the title um I like the yeah cover too. a little I think bit of thinking great. I think the cover's great too we were really excited about that because mm-hmm. yeah, I think yeah. it looks fresh and young I, gotta do, hey. mm-hmm. I, I think it looks looks um um you know you know kind of young and sexy which is kind of what yeah. I was going for so. <laughs> it's part of what it is you know. I also think that when you're picking it up, this is book about surfing. This is a book about California, but it's also a book about women. And I think that there are three different things that come together so well in the book. It's that time. It's a time and place. It is the sport. And you learn a lot about the sport if you don't know anything about it, those early days. And then you learn about these three women. And you learn about the counterculture of women, of somebody who goes too far, somebody goes to here, somebody just abandoned her children. 
And to think about, you know, that ending up happening and what the ramifications are. I think huge book club discussion book. I really do. Oh, I think there's so, so yeah. much you could have discussion about, you know, do you, yeah. do, book club, do, you do book club discussions with uh, readers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, sometimes they'll want to schedule it so far out. I can't commit. You know, it's like, right. I don't really know what I'm going to be doing the week of March 3rd. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um Yes, definitely. I get yeah. you can be emailed through my website. And what I'll generally do is pencil it in and then we'll circle back around closer to the time. And I mm -hmm. try my best to keep the commitments. Can't yeah, always really predict what life's going to throw you. But yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Because I and just there's think a, on my website, there is additional information mm -hmm. about the world of California Golden that tells you a little bit more about what was going on, you know, Whiskey A Go Go, uh, more of the history of, of surfing and Duke Hanamoku who brought surfing to the mainland in the 20s and 30s mm -hmm. and um some of the the cultural the you know the the things that people were doing the gidget movies the beach party movies where this year was the 60th year uh, anniversary in august of the first frankie and annette beach party movie, <laughs> movie that happened so there's a lot of background information and there is also a separate page for book clubs that right. has all the kind you know, of discussion questions and, and other things. And there's a lot of fun tiki theme things you could do for a book club with this one, you know, make the Mai Tais. <laughs> the like the candles, go outside and, you know, and you've got great blurbs on the back. I mean, really, really, you know, California Golden yeah. left me breathless, breathless, you know, and it really is, you explore the bonds of sisterhood and motherhood in an era when society's expectations of women were ever changing. And Shelby Bam Pelt, who wrote Remarkably Bright Creatures, says that. And I think that's a really great. I love her. And I loved I loved Remarkably Bright Creatures, one of my favorite reads. Yeah, and it is uh, complicated relationships. It's vibrant descriptions of California. I mean, And what I really like is um, there's a list in the back of a number of books that you use for research. So that if anybody's looking, there's, you know, in with the author's note, there are a number of books and, you know, places that you went to get research that I think people would enjoy as well. Um, how about the it audio? Is, it, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but and um, yeah, I mean, it is very much at atmospheric. It is very surfing. I just want to keep pointing out, but it's about these three women. It's women. <laughs> yeah. It is about the three yeah, women. That, and that's a universal thing: generational it, trauma, women, sisters, mothers. Yeah, women, sisters, mothers. But when you read, like, this is not a women sister story that I've read before. Like the the absent mother. Mm -hmm to the degree this woman is absent and then what happens to her later on. And we're, I don't want to give anything away. This is a hard book because though it's not a thriller, there's so many things no. I want you to discover. Like, you know, usually yeah. in a thriller, you can't talk about a book, but here I feel like there's so many things about the sisters and about the mother and things that happen. And really, I just went back and reread the last chapters of the book last night. And I just sat down and the way the book closes and you see where all these people end up, like where all the, like everything like clicks through. It's so interesting because it's not exactly what you think is going to be happening. No. To these people and what all. a lot of people haven't talked about again, I'm not going to give it away, but um, sometimes you can't avoid repeating the sins of your mother, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Some, 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 yeah. yeah. That so. and also what happens to you in life. And life, you know, people, people sit there in life and say, it's going to be X, Y, Z. My retirement's going to be X, Y, Z. And you, you, you dream, you dream and you come up with, oh, this is the way life is going to go. But life always doesn't cut that way. It doesn't always, you know, turn out that way. And I think that you really bring that to light of where life goes. You know, you're not Takes always on a long, strange journey, man. Doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> completely, completely. How about the audio? Christine Lakin does the narration for the audio book. Did you, have you had a chance to listen to it? And did you pick her? I, you know, I did pick her. Um, I'm very fortunate. Um, Random House Audio does all my beautiful audiobooks for me. And then my producer, who I've worked with in all my books, she'll send me a clip. She'll say, so uh, here's what I have, some people I have in mind. And she'll send me maybe five clips of different narrators. And then I listen and then I choose. And they've always respected my decision. And while I have not heard this yet, I, we have some friends staying with us right now who've been listening to the book on audio and they raved about the narrator for this. They they really loved her and said, because that makes or breaks a book yeah. on audio for sure. Yes. Um, so they, they uh, from my, my dear friends, there's a big thumbs up on the audio book narrator. So that's great to hear. There you go. There you go. Let's see, you have visitors. Visitors, could you listen to the book and share with me? You know, this is really good. You know, I, it's I, funny. I don't, I, I mean, I'll listen to 
a sample of yeah. it, you know, but I don't listen to the whole book because I know how it turns out. <laughs> I, I got how it ends. I got how it ends. Yeah. yeah and, and it is this really remarkable look. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting book on so many different levels. So what's next for you? Do you know what's next? Or are you playing well, um, Yeah, I, I thought I knew what was next and I, and I had an, and I wrote 30,000 words, but unlike this book, writing was hell. It was like, you know, life was my escape and the writing was hell. And then I realized then this book's not really working for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put it away. And, um, but I knew before I told any, anybody <laughs> that I was not going to write this book, that I better have another idea. So I did that thing I just told you about. I, I had an idea. I ran it by my, and I wrote a little bit. My agent didn't love the first, my first idea, not at all. And then I came up with another. And, and you know, it's amazing sometimes how fast it happens, but yet like California Golden, the idea I, I have now in a different form I had pitched years before. Mm -hmm. And and it didn't I couldn't even really see how to make it work, but it was an intriguing idea. So it's it, it, without being too cryptic, it, it's not that particular idea, but it's very similar. Um mm -hmm. so anyway, I, I came up with another idea, wrote uh, you know, a first chapter, um, sent it to my agent. She really did like it. Um, then she did the agent thing of being the one to reach out to random houses and say, here's what Melanie's thinking. But fortunately, they all do love the new idea as well. And all I can say is it is about one woman's journey this time. Um, uh, in the From 49 to like 70, mm. 1949 to like 70. And it's a woman who who is very much a product of her time and upbringing and the era she lives in at first. But but her job and her exposure to life causes her to grow beyond those limitations of her time. Um, and it is also my first book set in Chicago. So oh, yeah. that'll, oh, that'll be, yeah, that'll be fun. So I that's all I do research. Say. This is great. Yeah. yeah. You're about every two years. You write a book about every two uh, years. Come out every two, two or three. Might right. be a little now because now I'm starting over, you know, so, but th there was a, um, Two and a half years between Children's Blizzard and California Golden, so somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah between freezing and being in the sun. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, last and I'm not, I told you, I'm not right about the elements this time. <laughs> not right about the elements. Not right about the elements. And I, I wanted this to be a bit, very an uplifting kind of triumphant story. Yeah. So that's that's where I'm headed this time. Well, third yeah. time's a charm again for us interviewing you. So I'm really glad we got to do this, and we'll make a date for next time. So. Uh, earlier too <laughs> yes exactly exactly only it's great I as always carol I, you know carol thank you for book reporter for all you do for putting together readers and authors and you know we've we've talked about it it's not always easy uh these days to get um people talking about all authors mm -hmm. and so you are trying your hardest and um we all appreciate you Oh, thank you so much. We really, we love our readers because without them, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Amen. 27 years. Amen. We're celebrating 27 years this week. Believe no it or not. Way. 27 years. It started with that one little site on AOL. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, you we were like five, right? Oh when yeah, I was five. Yeah, I did that in nursery school. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was going to kindergarten. Yeah. No, 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 I have to stop admitting it because I still say I am 27. So, I mean, I'm giving myself away now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to redo some, do some changing with that. Do some yeah. math, do some math. Melanie, yeah. great to see you. To our readers, Thank look forward you. to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.